Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. So on the 22nd of January, there was a wonderful event in the world. Um, all of you are aware in Ayodhya, Lord Ram, after being exiled for so many years, uh, so many decades, so many generations, was invited back to Ayodhya and in a beautiful temple now, every single day, I think they say, uh, in the peak time, 150,000 people are coming every single day. So we want the temple in Eldoret to be as busy. Sometimes people ask, why do we need another temple? So many temples are there in the world. What will an extra temple do in Eldoret? There are already so many temples. Why another one? One time someone asked Srila Prabhupada this question, why another temple, Swamiji? Why are you building your own temple? There are so many temples lying vacant. Why don't you just take over those temples? So Srila Prabhupada looked back at the person and said, do you have children? He said, yes. Prabhupada said, there are so many children on the street. Why did you produce your own children? Why didn't you just take one of them? They said, we could have done, but we like to have our own child because it's from our own heart and from our own. Prabhupada said, similarly, we like to create our own temple because the temple is actually like your own baby. Just like when you give birth, then you, uh, everything, all of you are mothers, you know better than me. When you give birth, then all your attention is on the child. Mother's love is very, very special. One time they did a survey to find out what would it cost to employ a mother. Mm. So they calculated the mother drives the children to school. Okay, how much is a taxi driver? Then the mother is cooking for the family three times a day. How much is a cook? Then the mother is nursing the child when the child goes sick. How much does a nurse cost? Medical expenses. Then the mother is on call 365 days a year and the mother is always doing some overtime. So put the overtime, put it on the bill. And they did a survey like this to find out how much it would cost to actually employ a mother. I don't know in shillings how you would say, someone can do the translation. But they said in dollars, it would cost you to employ a mother with her dedication. It would cost you in the region of $160,000 a year. How much is that in shillings? It's a lot. That is the love of a mother. Even now when I go home, sometimes I go to visit my mother. For your mother, it doesn't matter you are a swami, or you come with a danda. For mothers, this is not so important. When you come home, mother is sit down, eat. And when I come home, the very first thing my mother always asks me when I come home, you know the very first thing she always asks? She always asks, where is your laundry? <laughs> because she wants to do... And if I ever go home and I don't bring any laundry for my mother, my God, it's a big, big problem. So oftentimes when I go home, I have to take clean clothes and say, okay, just clean this. Because the mother has to serve. The mother has to give. The mother is very, very selfless. So Srila Prabhupada, he brought up uh, children in Krishna consciousness, but his temples were like his own baby. We should all feel like that about the temple coming up in Eldoret. We shouldn't feel, oh, that's someone else's project. Oh, that, they will collect. Oh, no, they will go through the anxiety. We should all feel, no, no, it's my project. Uh, it's my baby. I have to care for it. I have to make sure. Because in, uh, 
in Vedic teachings they say it takes a whole community to bring up a child, isn't it? Is it only the mother and father who bring up the child? No, no. There's the grandmother, there's the grandfather, there are the aunties, uncles, there are the friends, and they all give something to the child, isn't it? Who's the favorite? Who always gives you presents? Mom and dad or someone else? Mom and dad. Okay. So like that. There are so many people in the family who are um, contributing. So we should be like a family and we should bring up this temple. Srila Prabhupada said his temples are like embassies of the spiritual world. So the first thing is we have to make sure that there's no fighting in the temple. Fighting, quarrel, disagreements, bad feeling towards others. This is the material world. This is not meant for our community. Sometimes there may be some misunderstanding between two people, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, they say, there's your version of the truth, there's my version of the truth, and then there's the real truth. So we think, no, no, my version, my opinion is right, they're thinking their opinion is right, but both of them only have a bit of the truth. You have to give and take. So cooperation is very, very difficult because Kali Yuga is the age of quarrel, arguments, isn't it? So much ego. Have you ever been in an argument with someone? And one time you're having an argument with someone and it's becoming more and more heated. And then at one moment in the argument you realize, oh my God, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But then what do you do? You just carry on arguing. <laughs> because the ego has become so big, we're not able to say sorry, we're not able to... Uh, we can't take the humble position. So we have to live together. When you come to Krishna Consciousness, to ISKCON, this is actually your family. This is actually our family. And sometimes in a family, someone may do something right, someone may do something wrong, but anyway, they are my family. So we're always together. And like that, when we care for each other, when we cooperate with each other, when we try to really give um, our hearts to serving each other, then all the blessings of Krishna come. The Prachetas, they were the sons of a king called Prachina Bharishat. And what they did is they went underwater and they did austerities for many, many thousands of years. Ten of them. Can you imagine living with the same person for ten thousand years? <laughs> they did. And when they come out from their austerity, Vishnu appeared. And Vishnu said, I'm very pleased with you. So they were wondering, why is Vishnu pleased with us? And Vishnu said, I'm pleased with you not so much because you did so many austerities. But why am I pleased with you? Because of your friendly relationships amongst each other. When you are friends together, then Krishna's blessings come, Krishna's blessings appear. There's one story of the Alvars. Have you heard of the Alvars? They were poets in South India, so they wrote books called Prabandham. And they are poetry, bhakti poetry, very, very beautiful, 4,000 songs. So one time there was a storm, and one of the Alvars, to get out of the storm, he just ran and he looked and he found a shed. So he went inside the shed, and the shed was very, very small, but he lied down. He thought, anyway, it's very small, but enough space to lie down. Let me just lie down, and I'll wake up in the morning and go. So as he went to lie down, there was a knock on the door. So it was still raining outside, and he saw outside there was another Alvar, and the Alvar said, can you let me in? He was looking around like, no space. Then the Alvar inside, he said, where one person can sleep, two people can stand. So he said, come in, come in, don't worry, I'll stand. So then they stood together the whole night, they were standing there, talking about Krishna. And then after some hours, uh, there was another knock. 
And uh, the third Alvar came and he said, I need shelter, I need shelter. Sorry, the first, second one they said, where two people can stand, uh, where one person can sleep, two people can sit. So when the third person came, they said, where two people can sit, three people can stand. So then three of them were standing. And like this, the whole night went by, they woke up in the morning. And then they were, uh, they didn't want to go out. <laughs> so there were three of them in there talking about Krishna. The storm had gone, but they were very happy to just talk together. And then one of them said, isn't it amazing that three of us could stay in here together all night? And then a voice came from the sky and said, there wasn't three of you, there was four of us. I was like, who is that? Four? Where is the fourth person? And Vishnu had come and Vishnu had said, Naham tistami vekunthe yogi naam radhe shuva tatra tistami narada yatra gayanti madbhakta Vishnu says, I'm not just in Goloka, I'm not just in the hearts of the yogis, but wherever the devotees are serving me, discussing about me, cooperating for my uh, pleasure, then in that place, yatra gayanti madbhakta, I'm in that place. Um, so like this, Krishna comes when there is great cooperation. So we have to cooperate. In this room, we're all very, very different. We all have different skills, we all have different talents, we all come from different backgrounds. Sometimes there may be an argument between us. When we walk through the temple and we see another devotee, if we feel some negativity in our mind, we should understand something is wrong. I should not walk around having negativity towards anyone. Dhritarashtra his whole life, he was given good advice, isn't it? Krishna came, gave him good advice. Akrura came, gave him good advice. But Dhritarashtra was not listening. Finally, Vidura came again and told Dhritarashtra, it's your last chance. Get out of the palace and dedicate your life to Krishna. Don't be so materialistic. And Dhritarashtra, he left. Vidura's words penetrated his heart. And Dhritarashtra said he went north, he went to the Himalayas and he began to meditate there. And in the Srimad Bhagavatam is mentioned that Dhritarashtra attained perfection. But what the commentators say is that he didn't achieve love for Krishna, pure love for Krishna. And do you know why? There was one block to Dhritarashtra achieving love for Krishna. You know what that was? Anyone want to have a guess? The one block was that in his heart he still had some negativity towards the Pandavas and specifically who? Bhima. Because Bhima had killed his final sons unjustly in his eyes. And therefore the commentators say because he had some negativity, negative feelings towards a devotee that meant that that space in his heart, love could not grow. So when we have bad feelings, negative feelings, critical views, uh, then we have to learn to let that go. Because otherwise there cannot be bhakti in our heart. Otherwise we're constantly thinking. The goal of life is not to remember all the terrible things that somebody did to you. The goal of life is to remember all the wonderful things that Krishna is doing for you at every moment. But how will you remember all of the wonderful things that Krishna is doing if the heart and the mind is hijacked by negativity? Therefore we have to learn to forgive. We have to learn to let go. And uh, when we build a community of love like this, then all of uh, Srila Prabhupada's blessings, all of Krishna's blessings will come. You see, a temple is not just a physical building. A temple is not just uh, the ceremonies and the ritual that goes on there. A temple is not just the festivals that we organize and the events that we advertise. But a real temple means where devotees love each other and where they actually serve each other and where they actually help each other to learn how to love Krishna. 
And so that's the real uh, opportunity. And so now you're building a beautiful temple and Srila Prabhupada's uh, uh, face, I'm sure, he is smiling like anything. Because when a new temple came up, then he saw that, yes, there is so much hope for the world. In a temple, we're meant to remember the spiritual world. The temple is known as Mandir, isn't it? In Sanskrit we say Mandir. Mana means mind and Dhir means peaceful. So when you come to the Mandir, it should be a place which is so spiritually charged that immediately your mind becomes very, very peaceful, very calm. Otherwise, outside there, the mind is very, very, uh, very, very agitated. So, Srila Prabhupada said, my temples are embassies of the spiritual world. Just like we are in Mombasa, and in Mombasa, next to one of our devotee homes, is the UK Visa Application Center. So, isn't it, when you go to an embassy of the other country, even though that embassy uh, is in a foreign country, as soon as you enter into that building, you feel like you are already in the country. And if you don't believe me, just go to the Indian Embassy in London. In the Indian Embassy in London, outside the temperature is minus two, and inside the fans are going on. In London, the great tradition is that everyone queues up. Indian Embassy. Raganuga Bhakti, <laughs> spontaneous, free for all. Outside, everyone is having so many things, but inside, all of the people on the checkout counter are chewing pan. So immediately, when you're in the embassy, you feel, why I'm already in India, although actually you're in London. So similarly, Srila Prabhupada said, when we come to the temple, we should actually, it's okay, no problem. Srila Prabhupada said, we should actually feel like we have entered Vaikuntha. We have actually entered the spiritual world. So it's a great test. It's a great opportunity for all of you that this beautiful temple is coming up. And uh, the quality of it will develop, depend on the quality of the community. So everywhere we're going now, we're sharing this, that Srila Prabhupada said, your love for me will be shown by how much you cooperate together. If we can't be the United Nations of the spiritual world, then what hope is there? Srila Prabhupada said, every time I go by the United Nations building, in Mombasa we also went, or not in Mombasa, in Nairobi, we went past the UN because there's a big conference right now. And Prabhupada said, every time I go past the UN building, I'm wondering in what sense is this the UN? Because every time I go past, there are more and more flags. So more and more flags means united? Or more and more flags means we're seeing division. Oh, they are from that place. I am from that place. They are like this. I am like this. They are from that culture. I am from this culture. Somehow, in Krishna consciousness, we have to go beyond that. We have to see. Vidya Vinaya Shampane Brahmane Gavihastini Sunni Chaiva Svapa Kecha Pandita Samadarshina. We have to have a vision whereby we don't me, uh, judge people by the externals. The famous uh, activist Martin Luther King, isn't it? He had a very famous speech called I Have a Dream. And in his speech, what did he say? Many beautiful lines. But he said, I have a dream. I have a dream that one day I will not be judged by the color of my skin, but by the content of my character. Very beautiful, he mentioned. That we should not judge people on the accent. He is man, he is woman, he is Indian, he is English, he is like this, he is, he is rich, he is poor. Why we see like that? In our temple in London, it's very interesting. I used, to, I used to live there in central London in our temple for one year. And what happens in the morning is that the Hindujas, you know the Hindujas? 
obviously very millionaires, multi-millionaires, maybe billionaires, I don't know. Every morning, without fail, the Hindu just come to take darshan of Radha Landinishwara. And sometimes they even sing Guru Puja to Srila Prabhupada. But the interesting thing is that next to the Hindujas in the Soho temple, oftentimes we can have someone who is homeless, someone who is on the street, someone who has nothing. And it's very, very amazing because here you have a complete millionaire. And then right next to him, you have someone who doesn't even have a house to live in. But what they're doing is they're both offering their bhakti to Krishna. And the Hare Krishna is a temple, is a place where there's no distinction. And so I always found that very, very interesting. Like that's very beautiful. In what other place in the world would you see that a billionaire and a homeless person are just coming at the same time to do the same thing without any special treatment or any distinction? I said, Srila Prabhupada, you would be very happy with this because it shows that devotees are not seeing each other in a material way. So, uh, this is the temple, the embassy of the spiritual world. And uh, what makes something the spiritual world? It's said that there are four types of Vrindavan. There is the Vrindavan in the spiritual world. That Vrindavan is known as what? Begins with G. Golok. Golok Vrindavan is Vrindavan in the spiritual world. Then there is Vrindavan in this world. When you fly to India and you go two hours from Delhi, that Vrindavan is known as, also begins with G, Gokul. Gokul Vrindavan. So there is the Vrindavan of the spiritual world. The second type of Vrindavan is the Vrindavan which is in this world. But there is said to be a third type of Vrindavan. And that is the Vrindavan which is created by a pure devotee. So when a pure devotee comes to a place and they establish a community in which everyone is serving Krishna, then that place becomes Vrindavan. And it's said that there's a fourth type of Vrindavan. And the fourth type of Vrindavan, can anyone guess? Vrindavan in the spiritual world, Vrindavan in the material world, Vrindavan which is created by the pure devotee, and Vrindavan in the heart. The devotee who then takes advantage of these three Vrindavans and always thinks of Krishna. Yena tena prakarena mana krishna niveshayet. One who then thinks of Krishna all the time, then is said that their heart uh, has become Vrindavan. So these are the types of Vrindavan. And what the teachers explain to us is that Distan Vrajay, Dadanuragi, Jananugami, you should always live in Vrindavan. But you may say, how can I go to the spiritual world? Very difficult. Then you may say, but how can I even go to uh, Vrindavan in the Mathura in India? Then you may say, but how can I go to the temple every day? Because I have to work. But then Krishna says, that's why you have to make your heart Vrindavan. Krishna's pastimes are Nitya Leela. They're always going on. Number one, because Krishna's pastimes are always going on in the spiritual world. Number two, Krishna's pastimes are always going on somewhere in the material world. But number three, Krishna's pastimes are always going on in the heart of the devotee. Therefore, Mother Yashoda, what is she doing? She's churning the butter. Her bangles are moving. Um, and he said that she's singing about Krishna. So the bangles are like a kartal. The moving of the wooden grinding mortar is like a mridanga. And her voice is uh, always singing about Krishna. She never wanted to forget Krishna. So she knows what she did. She made all of Krishna's pastimes into poetry. Because when you hear a poem, isn't it? Your mind always remembers. Sometimes you hear one of those songs on the TV and then you can't get the song out of your mind. So what Mother Yashoda used to do is she would make songs of Krishna. She would take all of Krishna's pastimes and then she would make it into a rhyme. And then while she was churning, she would uh, 
sing that rhyme and remember Krishna. And therefore, for one who is always remembering Krishna, then uh, Krishna uh, is very much present. Vrindavan is that place where Krishna is the center. So this is uh, our great opportunity um, of Krishna consciousness. So let me stop here and see whether uh, so far you may have uh, any questions or if there's anything you would like me to uh, speak about or uh, anything that's on your mind related to maybe what I spoke about or maybe uh, something else. Otherwise I can also carry on. But it would be nice to hear from you. Do you have any uh, questions you would like to ask or anything that's on your mind? Yes, Priya Govindam. How can we make our heart into Vrindavan? Krishna, He is the most pure. Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram, Paramam Bhavam, Purusham Shashvatam Divyam, Adi Deva Majam Vibhum. So Krishna is the prior Brahma, he's the supreme person. Param Dharma, he's the supreme abode. But the very, very special quality of Krishna is that he's Pavitra. Pavitra means Krishna is completely pure. So therefore Krishna goes to any place which is pure. Krishna doesn't look for abilities, Krishna doesn't look for intelligence, Krishna doesn't look for uh, results. Krishna looks to come to that place which is very, very pure. And therefore it says, Srinvatam Svakata Krishna Punyashravana Kirtana Ridyanta Stohya Bhadrani Vidunoti Suritsutam. The problem with us is that there are abhadra, many unclean things within our hearts. Every day we say things that we regret. Everything, every day we do things that we regret. And every day we even think things that we regret. And therefore, for a devotee, the biggest task in their life is how to cleanse their own heart. Because Krishna appears. Jeto darpanam arjanam bhava mahadavagni nirvapanam Krishna appears where one has cleanse the heart of the dust of lust. And therefore, when we become more pure, then we will feel Krishna, uh, Krishna there. But while we are envious towards others, while we are greedy, while we are always looking at, uh, while we are always judging others, finding faults in them, then Krishna will not come to such a place because that's an unclean heart. And so, uh, is it hard to clean your heart? What do you think? Sometimes people tell me, I've been practicing Krishna consciousness for so long, but I don't feel like I'm changing. Put your hand up if you feel like since the beginning of Krishna consciousness, you have changed. Put your hand up if you feel since the beginning of Krishna consciousness you haven't changed that much. Huh? So what does everyone else think then? Have you changed or have you not changed? What do you think? Prabhu, what do you think? Have you changed? Yes, we have changed. You have changed. What has changed in you since Krishna consciousness? It's like a day to day uh, lifestyle. Your habits have changed. Habits, you don't like to sleep late. Yeah. You don't like to eat from outside. Yes, don't. You don't like onions and garlic. Don't. Yes, <laughs> so our habits change. Otherwise to give up habits is very difficult. They say even when you take away the H from habit, still a bit remains. And even when you take away the A, still bit remains. And even when you take away the B, still it remains. <laughs> so they say habits are like uh, cozy beds in the winter time. Very easy to go into. 
very difficult to come out of. <laughs> so habits are sometimes difficult to come out of, but we see people change. One time Srila Prabhupada was on the stage with all his Western disciples and someone put their hand up and said, Can you Swamiji show us a miracle? What miracle? What great thing can you do? Can you manifest some ash? Can you make something disappear? Can you levitate off the ground? If you go Kumbha Mela today, have you ever been to Kumbha Mela? Kumbha Mela, very special place. I went to Kumbha Mela in 2010 and it's very, very special. You can see yogis doing all kinds of things. You can see a yogi, he will just grab Shiva Baba, he will just grab his lock in front of you, we've seen. He pulls it three times and immediately like this opens his hand and immediately there is a mound of kumkum kum powder. You can see. In Kumbhamela you can see some yogi who has buried themselves underground for many, many months without food or water. Once we were walking through Kumbhamela and there was a big crowd so we were wondering what's happening here? So they were all around a tree. And they were all shouting at this yogi who was sitting in the tree. She said, hey, what's going on here? He said, this yogi has been sitting in the tree for months and he hasn't said one word, Monavrat. And because he's controlled his power of speaking, he's attained the city called Satyavak. You understand? Satyavak. It means if you control your speech so powerfully, then eventually everything you say must come true. So they were all shouting, saying, say this, say, say I will be a millionaire. <laughs> Everyone was seeking benediction. And in Kumbhamela you can also see people levitating. Have you ever seen in your life someone levitating? You seen? Yeah, you seen the western one. <laughs> You didn't see the real one. There are yogis who can meditate because one of the siddhis is to become lighter than the lightest. Anima, Lagima, Prapti, these are all siddhis. So they ask Srila Prabhupada, what is your siddhi? What is your great miracle? What can you do? And Srila Prabhupada said, this is my miracle. And he showed all of the devotees who were from western backgrounds who had no prior experience of Krishna, but they had changed their whole life. And uh, they had become devotees of Krishna. So they had changed. So if we look in our hearts, we should ask ourselves, am I changing? Or is it that the same obstacles I had last year, I still have the same obstacles? Sometimes I go to a place and... Uh, Basically, we give the same class and answer the same questions. And that's not a good sign. Because if we give the same class, sometimes we go to a place and we give, I do it just as a test. I give exactly the same class that I gave last year. And people say, Swamiji, that was an amazing class. We've never heard anything like that before in our life. And I'm like, I said the same thing last year. <laughs> that means in one ear, out of the other. And people still ask the same questions every single year. Oh, Swamiji, how do I become determined? Oh, how can I uh, wake up early? How can I give up sense gratification? That means people are not changing. In the Christian tradition, they have confession booth. You know, confession booth. If someone does something wrong, then they come on a Sunday and they admit to the priest, I did this wrong. Then they give a donation and then the priest says, in the name of God, you are forgiven. Do not sin again. So one man, he came, he confessed, he gave $10. The father said, yes, you are forgiven, go. Then he went. Next week he came back. He confessed again. He said, here's ten dollars. The father said, don't sin again. Then the next week he came. He confessed. This time he gave twenty dollars. 
So the father said, yes, you're forgiven. He's walking away, he said, but hey, hang on, why are you giving $20? Every week you give $10? Why this week $20? He said, next week I'm going on holiday to Miami. <laughs> so I'm just covering up. Covering up, Pre prepayment. We're not changing. Prabhupada said, my miracle is that people change in their life. But most people don't change. And the reason most people don't change is because there's no discipline. There's no commitment. Abhyasa, yoga, yuktena. Krishna says you have to do abhyas. Then sometimes people say, but I don't have the determination. I can't do it. It's too hard. Only a few special people have the determination to be a pure devotee. And then I'm looking at them and I see that they brought up a family. I'm looking at them and I'm seeing that they've created a whole business for themselves. I'm looking at them and I see that they've become so prosperous in the world. And these same people are looking at me, telling me I don't have determination. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, how did you create this business if you don't have determination? I'm looking at them and saying, how can you bring up your children in such a beautiful way if you're not selfless? I'm looking at them and saying, you have more determination than me. But now you have to use that determination for Krishna. For anything we wanted to achieve in the world, we put so much effort in. But when it comes to bhakti, we think, oh, I will come. Krishna is in my heart. He knows. He knows I'm sincere. One day, he'll do it. Oh. Because Krishna tells Arjuna at the end, it's your choice. It's up to you. You take it seriously. If you want to achieve what other people don't achieve, then you have to be ready to do what other people won't do. But the problem is, we're very lazy. We're lazy. Prayenal payushaha sabhya kalavasmin yugejana manda sumanda matayo manda bhagya yupadrita. Bhagavatam says the main problem in Kali Yuga is that we're lazy. So, how do you make your heart into Vrindavan? By inviting Krishna. And where will Krishna come? Bhavitram, to a pure heart. And how do you develop a pure heart? Through the process of Krishna consciousness. But for the process of Krishna consciousness to work, you have to be determined. You have to have desire. And you have to, for whatever you wanted to achieve in the world, you have to be willing to risk, willing to put as much effort. If, if parents want to chance send their child to school, just like I was in Nairobi, so one parent was telling me, if we want to send our son to school, to university in London, you know how much it costs every year? It's going to cost you $80,000. And he looked at me and he said, I'm willing. I'm willing to work hard. I'm willing to make the sacrifice. I'm willing to pay that money. I don't mind because I want him to have a good education. I said, very good. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, imagine if all of us would have that much conviction or even 10% of that conviction to give our life and time and efforts to Krishna. We would be flying. So it's very much possible. But it requires effort, enthusiasm, determination, discipline, desire. Just like anything in this world. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, yes. So why are we forbidden from onion and garlic? Isn't it? Many times we go to Gujarati's houses and they say anything about onion and garlic we need. <laughs> this is necessary. Of course, garlic has many good health properties as well. Many say, you know, if you take garlic, it's good for your heart. I think for your heart. No? 
So why do we say no to garlic and onion? Because Krishna explained in Bhagavad Gita that every food is in either tamas, rajas or sattva. Ignorance, passion or goodness. So although onion and garlic is not considered uh, meat or it's not considered that we're creating any more violence in that than anything else we're eating, the reason we don't take it is because it's considered to be food stuff which is very, very agitating to the senses. And therefore, when one is eating these substances, along with other things, then what is happening is that the mind is becoming uh, somewhat agitated by that. And in order for Krishna consciousness to work, we need a steady mind. We need that. So, of course, we also have many other rajasic foods. For example, you know, cooking something and then putting too much chili in. This is also not good for Krishna consciousness. So not just onion and garlic we should stay away from, but also any rajasic foods, any foods in the mode of passion. Because if one wants to fix the mind on Krishna, then one has to try to uh, create as much goodness in their life as possible. Is that okay? Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for your nice and wonderful class. Maharaj, uh, how can we relate Krishna in our everyday life? Second, why only Krishna no other living or suffers? Okay, how do we implement Krishna in our life? We say step number one, give the first day of the week to Krishna. And what we say to these people who are beginning their spiritual life is every Sunday, make sure you come to the temple and take Sangha. That's the beginning of introducing Krishna in your life. Give the first day of the week. But then we say, when you want to go to level two, then don't just give the first day of the week, but give the first hour of the day. Every day, before you do anything else, can you pray to Krishna? Can you serve Krishna? Can you chant Hare Krishna before you do anything else? Then you are level two. Then we say the third level, give the first day of the week, give the first hour of the day, and then we say the third thing is give the first plate in the meal. Then what you can begin doing is not just sadhana every day, but you can begin changing your habits. And what you do by changing your habits is you bring Krishna into your lifestyle. And one of the main habits is offer your food to Krishna every day. It's very simple. You just, before, the first plate always goes to Krishna. And then we say to people, when you want to go to level four, then what you do is you give the first portion of the wage packet. When you earn money, when you earn something in the world, then the first thing we do is we give the first part of that sum to Krishna. In other words, we do practical service for Krishna. We try to help to further Krishna's mission, Iskhan's mission, by donating, by giving. And then we tell people when you advance further, then give the first place in decision making to Krishna. When you become further advanced, then what you do, whenever you have a decision to make, you'll know that you're on level five when you make the decision based on how it is favorable to your service for Krishna. Should I live in London or should I live in New York? Well, which one is favorable for Krishna's service? Should I send my child here or there? Which one is favorable for Krishna's service? So you give the first choice in the decision making to Krishna and then once you do all of these things then you give the first place in your heart you give the first place in your heart to Krishna one time Srila Prabhupada there was a Mataji who was newly married and Srila Prabhupada looked at her her husband was there and Srila Prabhupada said who do you love more Krishna or your husband so she was, 
she was little, like, what to say in front of Srila Prabhupada? And then she started crying. And she said, Srila Prabhupada, I don't love any of them. Neither I love my husband, <laughs> neither I love Krishna. My heart is empty. So you know you'll have bhakti when Krishna takes the first place in your heart. So like this, first thing, give the first day of the week. That means do sangha. Then give the first hour of the day. This means do sadhana. Then the third thing is give the first portion of the the meal. This means sadachar, your lifestyle. Then we say give the first uh, portion of the income. income. This is seva. And then we say give the first consideration in the decision making. And that means your vichar, you're always thinking, how does Krishna factor in? And then finally, you give the first place in your heart. And that means uh, love, prema. So we can't imit immediately go to give the first place in our heart to Krishna. But what we can gradually do is start evolving our lives so we bring more Krishna in. Like that. Is that okay? Oh, why only Krishna? We don't only worship Krishna, we accept everyone. We accept the devotees of Krishna, we accept the devatas as very empowered beings, we accept Krishna's incarnations as worshipable, but ultimately we understand Krishna's do Bhagavan Swayam. So the basic problem in the Hindu community is that people don't understand the difference between Bhagavan, Avatar, Devata and Jiva. People can um, confuse a Jiva to be Bhagavan. Or they convince Bhagavan to be a Devata. Or they convince an Avatar to be a Devata. Or they convince a Devata to, they confuse a Devata to be Bhagavan. So everyone often is confused. Who is what identity? Therefore we say most people's minds are like cement. Thoroughly mixed up and permanently set. <laughs> People have a mixed up idea, they have no idea. Let me do a quiz, to, let, let's see. You tell me which one is it? Bhagavan, Avatar, Devata or Jiva? You tell me which category, okay? Hanuman. Oh my God, we got all. Avatar, Devata, Jiva, confused. We don't know. Why don't we know? Dasmat Shastra Pramanam Te Karya Karya Vyavastiti. We must know who is God. Otherwise, uh, who are we worshipping? So Hanuman is the greatest servant of Ram. And therefore Hanuman is an empowered Jiva. Because he's always serving Ram. Brahma, which one? Devata. Because Brahma is in charge of the universe. Buddha. Jiva. Avatar. Avatar. Keshava Drita. Buddha Sharira. Jaya Jagadish Hare. Jaya Jagadish Hare. Jaya Jagadish Hare. Vishnu, Bhagavan or Avatar? This is highly controversial. <laughs> highly controversial. Put your hand up if you think Bhagavan. Put your hand up if you think Avatar. Put your hand up if confused.com. <laughs> So, Vishnu is said to be a Purusha avatar. When Krishna wants to create the material universe, then Bhagavan Krishna, what he does is he expands as Vishnu. And then Vishnu lies down in the causal ocean, isn't it? The Viraja. 
and from the pores of the skin of Vishnu, all the universes come. And therefore Vishnu is God at work. Krishna is God at home. And so most people don't realize this, that Vishnu is an incarnation of Krishna, an avatar of Krishna. Therefore these things must be understood. So we're not saying that there's anything wrong in respecting demigods. We should honor demigods. Like on Saturday, what is, what is on Saturday? Very special day? Shivaratri. So are we not now saying that no, no, we worship Krishna, no one else? No. Shiva is worshipable. Nimnaganam yatha Ganga Devanam Achuto yatha Vaishnavanam yatha Sambhu Purananam Midam Tatha In the ancient Shastra is mentioned Nimnaganam yatha Ganga Of all the rivers, Ganga is the foremost. Devanam Achuto yatha Of all the Devas, Achuta, Krishna is the foremost. Puranana midam tatha. Of all the Puranas, Srimad Bhagavatam is the highest. Vaishnavanam yatha sambhu. Of all Vaishnavas, those who are worshipping Krishna, Shambhu Shiva is the foremost. So we honor Shiva, we worship Shiva, but we worship him in his position for his identity. Because he's even said that Lord Shiva himself, on his Rudraksha beads, is chanting the name of Shankarshan. So even Shiva is worshipping Krishna, Shankarshan. So like that. Is that okay? Thank you. Yes, Mataji. So how, what do we do when we feel envious towards others? Therefore, in every situation, we may not naturally feel humble. But what we can do in every situation is we can always take the humble position. And therefore, every devotee has the opportunity in any given situation to, to always take the humble position. And the humble position means the position of service. So when we're envious towards someone, when we feel bad about someone else's success, when we see that someone is getting more attention than us, when we see that someone is doing better than us in spiritual life, and we feel envious, then the best thing you can do is go and serve that person and help them to be even more successful. Because when you serve someone, then gradually the heart becomes very, very soft. The heart becomes very, very um, uh, joyful by that service. And then one realizes, it's not me against them. Life is not a competition. We're taught in the material world that if someone else is winning, then it means I am losing. But in the spiritual world, when others are winning, you are winning with them if you're joyful and when others are losing if you help them to start winning then both of you win so like this uh, there's no room for envy we don't need to compete with others once there was a man and he got a uh, the genie said you can have whatever you want but the next door neighbor will get double so he didn't hear the second bit, he just said, I get what I want, great. So he said, I want a Mercedes Benz. So vroom, a Mercedes Benz came. And then as he was walking into the car to take it for a test drive, he looked at his neighbor, and his neighbor had two. Oh no. Then he said, I want a 10 story house. Vroom, 10 stories. He was on the 10 story, he was enjoying the view. 
And then as he looked left, then he looked right, and he looked at his neighbor on the right, and he saw he had 20 stories. Oh no! Then he looked at the genie and he said, I want to go blind in one eye. I want to go blind in one eye. That is envy. Krishna does not come in the heart of someone who's envious. Therefore, when it says more difficult than feeling happy, uh, feeling distress, compassion when someone is struggling, more hard than that is to feel genuinely happy when someone else is successful. <laughs> If someone is struggling, we feel like, oh yes, Krishna, help them, help them. Some compassion is coming. But when someone is successful, can you be happy? Can you actually be overjoyed in the heart that this person, I'm so happy for them, that Krishna is giving them mercy? Or in our heart are we feeling, why didn't it happen to me? Why didn't I get it? Why do the good things always happen to the neighbors? Because we're ungrateful. We're ungrateful. Therefore, there's no room for envy. We must serve. Okay. Okay, you, yourself and then Prabhu. Yes. You had a question? Yes. You have to speak loud. What's your name again? Say, speak in the mic. Rudra? Oh, okay. Rudra. Nice. As you say that something takes um, a place where your mind is at peace. And Brahman, they serve people who don't believe in my day and they go to most of uh, church. They say that because of Brahman, they, their own culture is great and they destroy. So because of who? Oh, because of Ram Mandir, that their place has been destroyed. Yeah. So, why does Krishna want to destroy others? Yeah, why did Ram allow that for them? Yeah. Over time, what happens is religious people, they fight, isn't it? Hindus fight with Muslims, Christians fight with Jews. Uh, Sikhs fight with uh, Muslims, so many things are going on. Krishna doesn't want any of this fighting to take place. Ram doesn't want any of this fighting to take place. But what it is, is because we are seeing others as material, because we are seeing others as different from us, because we are seeing others as the competition, and because we are trying to exploit others, then what happens is people argue and they put religion in the middle. And when they argue and they put religion in the middle, then terrible things have happened in the world. There was a time in the world when Hindus and Muslims lived together peacefully, actually. Srila Prabhupada said in Calcutta, when he was a boy, when he was growing up, your age, he said that even at Janmastami, even the Muslims would come to the temple and pay respects to Krishna. If you go to Jagannath Rathiyatra, even today, then you will see also Muslim people coming in front of Jagannath and offering their respects. Therefore, when there is a genuine spirituality, then instead of seeing differences, we see the common aspects and we live together peacefully. So we have to learn to see what is common with these people and let's try to build a bridge. Is that okay? Last question. Can you consider people as a religion to be part of Krishna? We say if they practice faithfully what they have been taught, they can they can achieve that no knowledge of God. So if we consider them Yeah. There are other religions where sometimes people are worshipping God, they're trying to love God, 
but they may be doing activities which sometimes seem to be against the principles of Krishna consciousness, like eating meat, for example. So is it that they have some love for God? Is it that? Yes, everyone has some love for God. But love is not one or zero. Love comes in stages. Have you seen a flower? When the flower grows, it doesn't overnight just go boom. What happens is it grows, then there is a bud, and then gradually it opens, and then when the temperature is right, then the full bloom and the fragrance comes out. So it's a process, it takes time. So love is like a flower which is unfolding. And we can say the love in different religions in the world is definitely there. But it's not the colorful, beautiful, fragrant love of prema bhakti. In other religions, they are worshipping God often out of fear. And therefore, although they have some love of God, there's also a lot of fear of God. So gradually what happens over time is that our love becomes more and more pure. And uh, if someone practices any religion with sincerity, then their love will grow. But at the same time, we can't say that their love has reached the ultimate stage is still a work in progress. Is that okay? All right. So thank you so much for your attention. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.